Okay, so my name's Olaf Bayer. I'm a, a landscape, I'm an archaeological investigator in the Historic England's uh, landscape archaeology team. And in this presentation written alongside Dave Went, I want to produce, kind of, yeah, cover three themes. I want to introduce how Historic England's terrestrial landscape archaeologists operate, what we do, and of course, work survey looks like to us. And then I want to look at how we've been increasingly integrating um, digital models derived from drone, drones, from LIDAR, from photogrammetry into our workflows. And then I think overall, the thing I want to emphasise is what I perceive as a real emphasis and significance and importance of what Mark was talking about, of interpretation and the continuing need for physical engagement with real landscapes on the ground. So, yeah, we have a, a nice example of a, an earthwork survey up here. And uh, like in parallel with our, our sister agencies in Wales and Scotland, we're inheritors of a, a tradition of practice developed by archaeological investigators and the ordnance uh, in the OS uh, um, archaeology division and the various Royal Commissions, commissions on Historic Monuments. Um, we produce detailed survey drawings where we tease out and interpret archaeology as we go. And accompanying those those survey drawings are, are yeah, kind of full reports detailing those those features that we've observed, how they relate to each other, and kind of working out their yeah, their significance, what they mean, creating a narrative from from humps and bumps. Um, and we've also produced guidance as to kind of how our how our practice works. I want to go through what's essentially the latest incarnation or iteration of our earthwork survey workflow, and, and use the example of Castilly Henge in Mid Cornwall. So, first off, we're, we're out in the field, and as you can see, uh, Elaine out there with a, a, a GNSS instrument, a survey grade GNSS instrument, mapping tops and bottoms of features. And that turns into a series of red and green lines, red lines for tops, green lines for bottoms, a framework within which our caches uh, will then sit. But the important thing to do is, is, is it's direct observation, and we're making decisions, we're making choices about what's in the story, what's out, out of the story, what's archaeological, what's natural. And we're teasing away the archaeology from the underlying topography, as it were. Um, and our aim is, is to depict kind of sequence stratigraphy, as well as the metric kind of qualities of, of the site. Um, yeah, so we want to come away with an idea of what, what we're looking at, what comes first, what comes later what it means rather than just how big it is and where it is. Um, we then take a scaled plot out into the field. And there's a lane with uh, drawing up something that looks like that. So that's our, our red and green lines taken out and printed out on it. On... Sorry, of course. So that's that. That's our uh, a, a scaled plot. It's our red and green lines taken out and we've drawn hashes, indicative hashes, over the top of those to indicate directions of slope, intensities of slope. We've scribbled on that drawing, we've made notes, we've, most importantly, we've chatted whilst we were doing it. Two of us kind of having a, a dialogue over the top of the framework that we've made and deciding what's in, what's out, what's part of the story we want to tell. And then finally, going back into the office and taking those, 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 those sources and uh, in Illustrator, a mixture of GIS or CAD, and then ultimately the Illustrator putting nice hashes on it, showing, yeah, the hashes showing direction and intensity of slope, and teasing, teasing out and emphasising those, those phases and different elements of the site. So I suppose what I really want to get at, and in these two slides, with two of my colleagues scratching their heads, doing a mixture of looking, pointing, thinking, thinking out loud, discussing and interpreting, is the idea that it's well, it's a subjective process. We're, we're choosing, we're making decisions, we're making active choices. But I'd say there's a validity to making active choices with the real thing in front of you that you can kick, that you can look at, that you can stand on. Does it squish? Is that lump that you can see really an earthwork or is it a pile of bracken? Um, and yeah, you can make choices. Here we're in a really it's a lovely landscape, really nice site, but this corner of it was a nightmare. It's, it's really complicated, lots of tusky vegetation, and it took us a long while to really, really tease out what the pertinent aspects of that site were. And that comes through that protracted backwards and forwards in situ deliberation uh, with, the, with the real thing at hand, well, really at feet and at eyes. You look at it with intelligent pairs of eyes. We have lots of really expensive high-tech equipment, but the most valuable thing that we possess when we're out in the field is trained, knowledgeable sets of eyes and knowledgeable sets of feet to walk over things, feel things, and work out what's going on. And I think there's a real, so, uh, something, uh, what's the word? Um, 
a real significance, a real wealth of interpretation comes from actually just physically being in the place that you're, you're writing about, the place that you're interpreting. Um, Mark says it's, it's that, that deliberate eye. I also think it's also that non-deliberate eye. It's having that, that landscape in the background as you're working, seeing it out of the corner of your eye, noticing how light changes a bit, which, which bits of the site are sheltered, which bits are horrible to work in. It gives you a feel for the landscape, gives you a feel for, for, for kind of the experience of being there, which I think is invaluable to gaining an understanding and writing about a site. So having set out our still for like what we do and why we think it's important, I then want to now talk about how we're beginning to incorporate remotely sensed uh, data sets into our workflow. Um, and we've been doing it for more than a decade. Uh, we've been in, and, and using LIDAR in both our aerial and terrestrial landscape surveys. An early example is the, the Minor Farmer project in, in Cumbria in uh, 2009. And here we took um, 50 meter LIDAR um, um, kind of visualizations printed out on sheets of permatrace and annotated them with, with features in the field. And yeah, from this point onwards, LIDAR has become a routine element of our, of our workflows, both, on, both from in the air and terrestrially. Um, if we have um, an example from Thornton Abbey in Lincolnshire, where we've combined basically a, a previous earthwork survey, but then combined uh, LIDAR-derived uh, hillshade models, and basically comparing the two taking the LiDAR and, and seeing whether it actually, how, how well it marries up with what had been an earlier survey. And it wasn't just a test to see like how good were our surveys, were, how good our surveyors were and how accurate they were. It's just really to see what the, the two different data sources will tell us. And although the, the LiDAR is, is metrically accurate and it's, it's really eye-catching kind of um, kind of interpretational plot, what it doesn't really have is the kind of the, the, the richness of interpretation that goes with it, that goes with, with uh, uh, certainly the, 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 the image derived from, from the survey on, on screen, uh, where there's a, there's a narrative written alongside it. And even if it takes a little while to get your head around looking at hashes and understanding what they mean, the derived drawings that come from it, you know, equate to like every single feature being accorded to a phase in the site's development. And uh, yeah, you get a richness of description. And what we're really, I suppose, what we're, we're trying to get at a question is, is like, how do we derive the same sort of wealth of understanding from models alone? Or can we do that? Even. Moving on to a, a, another approach, taking an ash not mine in the forest of Boland in Lancashire. And this lunar landscape represents lead mining from the, well, the late 13th through to the late 18th centuries. And well, okay, you have an image which is a, a, a LIDAR uh, derived uh, visualization. Then you have a, a survey plan. And, and it was really the, 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 the drawing, um, the hasher plan was derived from the model and then checked back out in the field. And in the LIDAR is, is you know, it, it, well, sorry, is it LIDAR or is it it's, it's photogrammetry? The photogrammetry is very, very quick to do. It takes a matter of hours to capture the data and process the data. And uh, that replaces what might have been a week in the field for two surveyors to, you know, to, to come up with it, those results. Um, but there was definitely a need to go back out into, into the field, clarify ambiguities, check relative weightings of, of, of features. And uh, yeah, but from this point onwards, it, it's kind of really has become you know, an integrated part of our workflows. Uh, we now routinely use LIDAR, uh, plane-derived photogrammetry, and increasingly drone-derived LIDAR and photogrammetry as an integral part of, of, of what we do. So another example from I Hunsley uh, in East Yorkshire. And it's, it's really just, like, you know, you can look at the nice images that LIDAR gives us. They're, they're, they're pretty, they're compelling, they're, they show you know, various different visualizations uh, they're objective, they're reliable, they're repeatable, um, but I would still, and, and, and to the sort of the trained eye to somebody who understands this sort of archaeology, they can instantly see what's going on, but they're not ubiquitously useful in terms of communication. And the, the question, um, well, for, for me really is this, it does remain a picture on its own without interpretation. It's pretty, but it doesn't, doesn't necessarily communicate, give understanding. I suppose a worry that we have is that with the increasing use of drones is that it, it's the model becomes the end result rather than meaning that we've got a massive growth in recording of earthworks and of data capture but that comes at the expense of, of interpretation and understanding and as we start to concentrate on doing this sort of work we also worry that, that our skills in, in earthwork survey are atrophying, that they're, they're, they're diminishing. If we don't practice, we don't keep them up to date. And as a sector, I think we're losing that capacity to do analytical, analytical earthwork survey on the ground. 
Just to run through now a series of, of, of short case studies of how we're applying and mixing and matching earthwork survey on the ground with, with models. Here we are back at, uh, at Castilli Henge. And for me, this was, well, we, we, we surveyed it on the ground using well, the methods that we sort of set out in, in previous slides. And then what I was really after was just like having surveyed it in a, in a traditional manner is, is comparing a series of different models and seeing which ones actually could be useful, what sorts of visualizations could be pertinent for, for helping us. And really, because I had the survey data there already, what I was using this for really was an aid memoir. It was, it was like I'd done the survey in the field, I made my observations in the field, but to finesse my hasher plan, it was really, really useful to have things, just to have like this almost objective visualization of, of weightings of slopes and stuff. It, it enabled me to kind of really sort of tease out the things. And then by, by necessity, like I've been looking at a site in Cornwall, I'm writing up and drawing up in Oxford. I can't just pop back to, to have another look. For me, it's, it's a useful way of capturing and bringing an elephant of the site back into the office with me. Another example is, is a survey that I, I started at least with Mark and then went off on paternity leave at Walbury Hill for above uh, Western Supermare. It's a site in thick woodland. And normally we'd do this with TST survey and we'd spend weeks at it, you know, finding sight lines between trees, uh, doing a, a, you know, an accurate traverse framework uh, within within the woodlands and then taking me offsetting measurements from that. And it would, it would produce a beautiful accurate plan, but it would take us a very, very long time. What we did here was an experiment using an existing terrestrial uh, laser scan on the main body of the hill fort done by Cotswood Archaeology. But then taking that laser scan data back out on, on printed in reverse on sheets of, of, of drafting film and <coughs> annotating onto that uh, and adding, adding to it. Uh, the scan producer gave a really accurate metric framework for what we were doing, but we were then able to make decisions and choices and interpretations over the top of that. So you should be able to see some of that uh, within within the next couple of slides. Working. So there's the box that I'm going to show. And there's the raw laser scan, a slope model, a multi-directional hill shade of the same. And there's our sketching, or Mark sketching, Mark and, and uh, many other colleagues sketching on top of it, drawing out what's pertinent, adding in extra features, stretching measuring tapes between known points on the scan and points you could see on the ground to fill in and add detail. But it's that, those sorts of scribbles, notes, indicative hashes, which then enable uh, kind of the, yeah, there's our, our tops and bottoms, areas of thick vegetation, areas of stone shown, and ultimately for our colleague Sharon Souter to, to, go, to produce a really detailed hatcher plan. So it's a nice, kind of a, a mixture, a nice, a nice use of both both traditional and new forms of surveying. And a final example uh, from Chester Crane Camp uh, on the, on, in the, on the, on the, the well, in, in Northumberland. It's an Iron Age promontory fort with medieval cultiv cultivation ridges. And it's a, a one to 500 scale graphic survey, so using a, a plane table and tape and offset, combined with elements of uh, GNSS survey, but then also combined with, with uh, the outputs from, a, from a, a drone survey, both photogrammetry and LIDAR done by, uh, by Wessex Archaeology. But both, both sources were combined uh, in the final drawing up, uh, which you can see, almost like an honesty diagram. Those points which are shown in red are those points which were derived from real, from, from in-person, on the ground, uh, uh, conventional earthwork survey and uh, those that aren't coloured in were, were taken from the terrain model. But, but we're not taken blind, combined with real, real, uh, real world observations on the, on the ground. But what it does, I think, is it illustrates is, is you, you can be selective. You can work out which bits you can get with ease from the model and you can get accurately from the model and which bits need more interpretation, need more work on the ground. And for me, it's that pragmatic approach to using uh, terrain models that I think is what we're going to adopt going forward. It's not that they're, they're silver bullet technologies, they are transformative technologies, but in and of themselves, they don't answer all the questions. I'm beginning to think of, of these remotely sourced data sets as akin to how five or six years ago, I might have taken an air photo out of the field with me and used it to think with. It's, it's, another, it's another source, but I think for me, that, that doing work on the ground remains key. And there is a debate about that honesty policy about showing uh, how you have derived your understanding, how you, which bits you've done uh, as a result of survey, and uh, which bits which bits are are are, are devolved or or, or, or or taken from from uh, pre-existing models. And then to go back to the questions, which I can't see without my glasses on. And okay, 
Can you read out my, your questions then, Dave? So I can't <laughs> see them. <laughs> so what, the questions are, what are the most effective means of deriving archaeological interpretations from digital models? And for me, the most effective way is by taking them back out and thinking with them in the field. Um, we have now got GNSS um, controllers and TST controllers, which can take terrain models out into the field with us georeference. We can add our lines on top of them. That's useful. I still find taking printed, <laughs> wet, soggy <laughs> printouts out into the field is actually more practical. You can really, I can, I can scribble on top of them. I find that really useful. But I think, yeah, the most, the most important thing we do is we take our models, our digital models, out with us and think with them in situ. And we use them. Um, so, what's, how can we combine drone acquired models and ground survey to best effect? I think by using them selectively, intelligently, and pragmatically, working out where what makes most sense on a given site. Uh, models can really, really speed up the process. And we have to work out what's, what's easy, what's straightforward, what can come straight off the model. For me, I used to spend hours surveying in fence posts to give me a framework of where I was working, surveying in concrete pathways, lots of modern detail, which are not necessarily key to the understanding of the site, but give me a framework to work with. I now take all of that model off, all of that information off models. I no longer record stone for stone. I might you know, annotate and okay, that stone's in, that stone's out. I might, I might scribble on things, but it, it's kind of like, I would never do that level of detail with a, with a, to with a total station again. Um, but then on some sites, um, it, it really does, it really is important to, to be taking much, much more from, from direct observations. And I suppose to yeah, contrast the two sites I've got on screen here. Here, this is a, a probably an early near Victorian closure at St. Stephen's Beacon in Cornwall. Big earthwork features where the th and complexity that you really need to look at and think about on the ground. As compared to some recent work uh, done by Matt at a, a Cordite factory in Dorset, where you've got lots of sharp edged concrete features and also a, a kind of a, a, you know, contemporary plans of it in use. And I think your, your approach to how you would use uh, LIDAR and, and, and drone based imagery would be different here. You, you could be much more reliant on it and would provide a very, very good uh, framework within within which to make selective choices, like which bit need which bits needed on the ground survey. And then coming to the final question. Um, is ground survey still necessary in achieving robust interpretation? And I'll say almost without exception. I can think of possibilities like Flowers Barrow when I'm working on the South Dorset coast, which is trickling off a cliff top. There may well come a time when actually drone survey is the only thing you can do there because it's not safe to work there. But pretty much that's the only sort of circumstance. I, it's also in a firing range, so sometimes we really can't get in there. It's not safe to get there. Uh, it's a lovely site, but a bit tri logistically tricky. Um, and there we may, wait, we may well make considerable use of drone derived models. But I think in most circumstances, I'd argue it's much, much better to have that immersive physical interaction with the real thing than it is to have a desk based interaction with a pixelated depiction of it. And I accept that within our workflows, we build in time for going out into the field and we have the luxury of time to do it. But I think even if you are rely much, much more on drone based surveys and their outputs, that there really is that real need to take those results back out into the field to pick them apart, interrogate them, discuss them, and uh, interpret with the real thing in front of you. Work out what's yeah, what's 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 a, a tuft of heather, what's a lump of bracken, what's a gorse bush, and, and what's real important archaeology. And I'll leave it there. <laughs>